Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to PMI Northeast Ohio Chapter's COVID-19 fundraiser event. This is session two of three of our fundraiser events, and uh, the first session was held yesterday, and the final <laughs> event is tomorrow at the same time. So please uh, join us for that as well. Today, we have guest speaker Fred Coos, who will be talking about planning with Scrum. But before we get started, I just wanted to remind everybody that these events are uh, are set up to support local communities in Northeast Ohio that have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. As I mentioned, we've had, uh, we have a three webinar series. Uh, the first one was held yesterday um, and the last one is going to be held tomorrow. Um, we all know people who have been affected by the pandemic uh, personally and um, we've all heard about people getting affected as well. Um, just want to remind you guys that you can donate now by going to event page on PMI Northeast Ohio's website and clicking the donate button shown in the screenshot um, here. Um, and uh, just want to mention that uh, there's no amount that is too small and it is all going to a worthwhile cause in uh, local communities that we all uh, know. So um, with that being said, I just want to quickly remind uh, everybody of a couple ground rules. Um, as usual, we will send out the PDU, uh, we will share the PDU codes uh, towards the end of the presentation so that uh, you can claim your one hour of technical PDU. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, uh, please submit them to the chat option or the Q&A feature. We will be actively monitoring both of those. Uh, we also record all of our webinars and we make them available on our YouTube channel. So if you missed yesterday's webinar or you wanna catch up on any of the previous webinars, please go to PMI Northeast Ohio's YouTube channel and you should be able to find them there. Um, and finally, uh, you'll be getting a survey link after the webinar closes um, and uh, you can provide your feedback there. Please take some time to fill it in. It's very useful to us in coming up with uh, new topics to talk about and continue improving our webinar series. Now, jumping over to the speaker, uh, Fred Coos is, a, I will talk briefly about him and let him do most of the talking, but Fred Coos is a director at UPMC. He has 25 plus years of project program portfolio and PMO management. Um, he's been heavily involved in PMI um, and traditionally the PMI Pittsburgh chapter uh, where he wrote monthly articles. Um, and, uh, and he has helped contribute and review I uh, items for two different books, uh, both for PMI and SAE. Um, He's a vastly experienced speaker. He's given multiple presentations at institutions such as Penn State, Carnegie Mellon, and uh, as I mentioned before, multiple PMI events. So uh, with that being said, uh, over here, I will stop sharing my screen, let Fred take over, and, uh, and we will go from there. So Fred, over to you. Great, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yep, we're able to okay. hear you. I just, <laughs> it's interesting, just a minute ago, my Bluetooth cut out. I've been using it all morning uh, for another presentation. So thank you very much for um, you know, inviting me to this session. Yesterday I listened to David Barrett and that was a, an awesome session. And tomorrow, um, Jeff Tove, I, seen him and know him at him he's done work with us uh as well presentations and and other work so um you have a great lineup here with, with those two i'm kind of humbled to be in the middle of them uh but thank you for for the opportunity and and this is a great cause so happy to be here um so if we the the topic today is planning with scrum uh, many people in, in the Agile world will resist planning or say, oh, we're Agile and we don't plan or we have a different way to plan. But uh, one of the topics that often comes up is in companies and organizations, we have goals and, and we have customer needs and the customers and the organization want to know and need to know when we're going to be done with specific items in our projects. And, and we can't just tell the customers we're agile, you get it when you get it, which is sometimes what we hear 
uh, from some of our teams. So Agile actually has some great uh, approaches that we can use when we're planning with Scrum or with other Agile methodologies. And, and so that's really what we're here to talk about today. This is planned to be a little bit of a <clears throat> um, working session. In other words, <clears throat> it's not all just a, a presentation and slides. I'm gonna dig into uh, an Excel file and, and I'm specifically using Excel today because many of you may use other tools like VSTS or Azure DevOps uh, from Microsoft or Rally or uh, even Teams has you know, some agile functionality. Microsoft Project has agile functionality. Uh, Clarity and others. There are many, uh, many software packages. But to bring that down to a common denominator, I'm just going to use Excel, which works really fine for a lot of agile work, especially if we can put it in a collaborative workspace like like Microsoft Teams. So I'm not suggesting you don't use those other applications. Just for this more general topic, I think Excel is a more general tool to use. So what I'm going to be doing is going back and forth a little bit between the slides and, and how we can view things in Excel. So to start with Scrum, what is Scrum? Scrum is one of the agile methodologies, and I think many of you are familiar with Scrum. It's one of the agile methodologies under the agile umbrella that, that we can apply. And so I won't spend a lot of time here, but just to kind of level set on where we are, um, Scrum starts with a product backlog. A product backlog doesn't magically appear. Often we need a larger project around the Scrum project so that we can create the product backlog, the design work, the, the project goals and things like that, that, that we need. If we look at the 10 knowledge areas of project management, those are not all contained within Scrum. We often need a project around Scrum that creates a project charter and manages stakeholders and our stakeholder engagement, the communication plan, and all those project things can wrap around Scrum. With that, um, we have, we start with a product backlog. That's just a list of things to do. Then we do sprint planning and create a smaller list of things that we can do in the first sprint. So the product backlog is the list of things we do for the whole project. Um, and by the way, for some of you, uh, that have used Scrum outside of project work, that's fine. Scrum can be used for ongoing work. The, the scope of today is using Scrum for project work. So in that case, the product backlog would define what we have for the whole project. And then if we just look at this first slice here of the prioritized product backlog, we'd pull from that and create a sprint backlog of what we're going to accomplish for a sprint. Sprints, <clears throat> uh, when the Agile Manifesto was written in 2001, they, they mentioned in the Agile Manifesto, sprints could be a couple of weeks to a couple of months. Uh, over time, sprints keep getting shorter, which is a good thing. The closer we can get to a single piece flow and delivering more value early and often, in smaller increments, in shorter sprints, the better. Two weeks is a common sprint time in my experience. So, so let's say this is a two week sprint. Then we, then we follow Scrum for two weeks. We do daily standups. At the end of that two weeks, we review the actual value that we have created and we have an increment of value. We have a, a lessons learned or a sprint retrospective, and we start the whole thing over, pulling from the back product backlog, doing sprint planning, and the sprint backlog, and so on. So that's a, a high-level view of Scrum. Um, and I, I think there's a way online for us, uh, Persona or somebody else, to get some feedback. Is it possible that we could ask people to type in to the chat 
um, who has worked with with IT projects with Scrum and who hasn't. And while you're typing, I'll say Scrum is not just an IT tool. Scrum is a tool for many types of work that can be done in um, a variety of ways to break big projects down into small pieces and deliver that value early and often. So as you're typing, um, can I get some indication? Is there? Yeah, there we have a couple of responses coming in. It looks like most people have used Scrum. Some people have recently started using Scrum on their recent projects and only a handful say that they have not. But it looks like most people um, have gotten some experience with Scrum um, with only the handful um, not having any. Okay, great. Or some people have said that they don't have any formal experience with Scrum. So maybe some form of Scrum. Okay, great, great. Thank you very much for, your, for typing in your input and for the summary, very helpful. Uh, so what we're doing here is talking about tying Scrum to project work. We're, we're the Project Management Institute here. Uh, there are larger frameworks, many of them, some more popular, that help put a larger framework around Scrum, like the Scaled Agile Framework and Large Scale Scrum and Scrum of Scrums, and, and we could go on. What we're going to talk here about is more directly, if we have a project and we're applying Scrum, how do we, how do we tie that together? How do we plan with a project with Scrum? So here is a slide that has a Scrum framework in the, in the center, and around this is the project work. So think of all the things that you know you need to do to manage a project robustly that aren't part of the Scrum guide, and you can download the Scrum guide for free by just Googling the Scrum guide. So it doesn't cover all the things that you would need to do. So around Scrum, is all the project work, uh, managing scope and time and cost and quality and procurement and human resources and risks and issues and stakeholders and, and so on. <clears throat> Feeding into when this product backlog, which starts Scrum, is the list of things that we need to do. So, so we start by defining value in small increments and we end and give value back to the project in small increments and each of those increments build on each other. And that, that's a common thing that I've seen in a variety of organizations where we don't, um, sometimes the teams don't define value in small increments that build onto each other. So I would think of a systems engineering approach from this regards to say if we're and maybe with a, an analogy of a puzzle if we're building a puzzle on a table <clears throat> we could build the left corner with a couple pieces in the right corner with a couple pieces in the you know the bottom left corner with a couple pieces and a couple in the middle but it's not tied together uh, and, and if we're trying to provide increasing levels of value to the customers if we if we don't have the work tied together and integrated together we're not maximizing the amount of new value that we're adding with every sprint we're providing different pieces of value that's not fully integrated in the value stream so what i'd propose is that in the project work we define like like we would do in a systems engineering approach, we define the the system, and then we define the subsystem, and then the sub subsystems, and the sub sub subsystems, if we want to call them that, and and each new piece of functionality connects to and builds on the previous piece of functionality, so our ability to test end to end keeps getting. Uh, longer in that in that chain. Um, so breaking down work's important. All right, so now the 20 steps. 
the scrum guide has great information and this is what what's here in these steps is fully aligned with the scrum guide but also tied to project work and tied to a systems engineering approach um, and, and pulls in some other disciplines as well so this this is high level uh, we have an hour here today so we'll go through these pretty quickly there's a lot of additional detail below these so these 20 steps um, let me kind of frame them at a at a high level before we jump into them individually the first three are defining the scrum team scrum teams made up of a product owner development team scrum master the next is defining the hierarchy what is the large system and what do we call it in the subsystem and sub subsystem and sub 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 we don't use those terms usually we use other terms like theme epic or something like that then doing some system design and product backlog grooming and and starting to build the product backlog and prioritize and estimate and accumulate the estimates and doing the sprint assignments and then defining the sprint end dates which roll back into the project schedule which help us define the project intermediate dates and end dates. <clears throat> it's important to know that typically with agile methodologies, we're estimating things at a very high level. And, and so there's a tolerance around those estimates. There's a range around those estimates. They're not exact. So if we need to make some project commitments, we, we, we need a buffer in there. There are a variety of names for that buffer. Um, managing the sprint backlog and tying that to the product backlog and sprint planning um, comes next some of the scrum events like sprint planning daily scrums uh, we have a sprint review and retrospectives also the the burn downs is what we're really going to talk about here how do we tie the burn downs of the sprint and the, the burn down of the product backlog together and link those to a project plan effectively. Um, something that is not really discussed in a lot of the agile um, methodologies, but is, is pretty straightforward in our application. And then the last step is we have an increment of value. So these are 20 steps that can integrate together to enable us to better create project schedules with with scrum as a large part of the project not all of the project but a large part of the project okay so the first three steps pretty straightforward if you know scrum or have read the scrum guide um, scrum product owner we need to define the team right the team has three roles a scrum product owner represents the return on investment for the product and for the for the the overall business owners so the product owner represents the customer and should understand two parts of return on investment the return the value or return that we're getting and the investment so they should understand the investment that the development team needs to put into different pieces of functionality and some functionality may require weeks or months of investment with a small value other functionality may require a little bit of investment, a week of development investment with a large value. So that's the product owner's job is to really figure that out. The development team, three to nine people. Um, development teams are, are the people who do the work. This could be not only software work, this work could be construction work. I've worked on and you know some people um, kind of wonder how you do this but i've worked on construction efforts with a scrum and agile approach it could be business process improvement efforts many many different types of projects can benefit by the scrum and the agile approaches so the development team does the work three to nine people ideally they'd be cross-functional they'd be able to to uh, do a variety of types of work. In other words, if we're building a house, then the development team, everybody should be able to pound nails with a hammer and you know, do some basic work because we're, the electricians aren't always gonna have electrical work to do. 
the plumbers aren't always going to have plumbing work to do. In Scrum, we have a team that stays together and the whole team does all the work. Okay. Then, so that's three to nine people. If we have more work than that, we should divide up into smaller teams. Then the Scrum Master is the facilitator of the Scrum process. Right. So those steps one, two, and three. Step four is the hierarchy. The reason this is spelled out specifically is uh, sometimes teams in team members get confused. They're, they're worried about the, the, let's say the stories, the user stories, but don't always, in my experience, um, always have the higher level in the higher, higher level picture in mind. And some of the software packages are harder to use when they're more one or two dimensional, some of the software packages. So having this hierarchy is, is important to name and, 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 and operate by. So for example, we may say if we're building a house that the theme is the house, that's the high level system. Below the theme, we may have epics. We may have an epic to be able to cook food. So we have a kitchen. We may have an epic to be able to entertain. So we have a living room or a family room. We may have an epic to be able to eat our meal. So we may have a dining room or, or a, you know, a kitchen with a, with a dining table in, in it. So the, underneath the theme that could be the, the whole house, we have epics where we break things down. Each of the epics need to fit together. And that's where the design and systems engineering comes in. We should be able to walk from the kitchen to the, the dining room. Um, sometimes I've seen on software projects that one team's building the kitchen, the other team's building the dining room, for example, and, and walking between them isn't done till much later in the project we'd want to connect those from the beginning. So every sprint that we release, things should be connected together. So the epic. And then the stories. The, the stories are, are user stories. That could be a story that would say, I want to boil water for spaghetti. So I need to get the pan out of the cupboard, which should be close by, be able to fill it up with water in the sink and, and um, you know, put the spaghetti in from the cabinet above, boil the water, cook the spaghetti, put it on a plate and serve it. So the stories are the next level down below the epics. And then the tasks are the, the next level below those. So if we have a task, they need to build on, they need to, to be the task to build what's needed for the stories. So if we need a cabinet to store spaghetti and the task would be to build the cabinet. So the point here is you can use whatever words you want for these levels, but the team needs to agree on what are the levels and what are we gonna name the levels and how are we gonna design for agility? So I'm gonna say that again, design for agility, which includes designing work that can be done iteratively and each new sprint builds on and connects to the, the value from the previous sprint. Okay, so that's step four, the hierarchy and, and the structure around Hey, that. Fred, we, we do have a question about the hierarchy. Um, there's a question about how do you document this? Is this documented in some sort of Gantt chart or is there a recommended way? That, that's a great <clears throat> question. Um, there, there's in projects, if we look at the PMBOK, it defines a project charter. In agile teams, there's a, a team charter. And the team charter defines how the team's going to work together. So one place you could put this definition is in the team charter, which tells how is the team going to work together on the agile project as opposed to the ad or a project charter, which defines the project. That's where I would suggest putting this. Um, depending on the software we're using, if, if we're using, <clears throat> for example, um, what was called VSTS or now Azure DevOps from Microsoft, 
if that's where we're storing our stories and tasks, there are a variety of places in there. One place could be create a wiki, which defines the, the how we're going to work together. Um, so it should be a readily accessible document like a, an agile team charter that defines what we're going to do. That's my suggestion. I think that's helpful. Thanks. Great. Okay, so so now the team knows how the different levels fit together, and you know we could spend a lot of time talking about you know systems design and systems engineering, but the key is again things fit together. Then the next step five, <clears throat> system design, um, and backlog grooming. At the beginning of a an agile project, and and I'm going to differentiate project versus ongoing agile work. Okay, so a project has a beginning and an end. <clears throat> and at the end, we need to define value and a customer or organization is expecting that. So that's different than ongoing agile work. So if we have a project and we're gonna do that work with agile methodologies, um, at the beginning, we should have a high level definition end to end of three perspectives I would recommend people process and technology. So business process, one of those. We should have a very high level business process mapped out. People, a very high level user experience mapped out and technology, a very high level architecture drawing. Those should be done at the beginning before we start sprint one, because they, they can be done often with, within an hour on a whiteboard. Take a picture of it with a cell phone, and say, here's our starting point. So we're all on the same page. Then, and, and that could be in the previous slide at the theme level and with the epics is the next level below. And then for sprint one, we would get to a rolling, what the pinball calls progressive elaboration, um, of more detail for sprint one. So in sprint one, we get down to the stories and when we get to sprint planning, just for sprint one, the tasks. So um, one mistake I, I believe that a lot of projects make when they're using Scrum is take things two weeks at a time, which is good, but we still need the high level picture of where we're going. And that high level picture of people process and technology should be continuously updated with every new sprint. Okay, so we have the high level system, then get to the subsystems, or we could call it themes or epics. You know, the team should choose the names they want to use um, in a rolling design. And then we can deliver the small iterations of value, the small increments of value quickly uh, in two weeks or the the frequency of, of the duration of the sprints. Okay. And then, so grooming. Grooming typically happens, you know, periodically. It, uh, I would suggest if we have a two week sprint, get together and groom weekly, but the team can figure out the frequency. Grooming is about product backlog grooming. And so we'll, we'll cover this slide, then we'll jump to Excel in a, in a second here. The, the product backlog, step six, structure the product backlog, the lists of things with the, the higher level design. So I often say lists have risks. If we just have a list, a list doesn't tell how things fit together. And if we think about failures on projects and failures in systems from a systems engineering perspective, failures are, are largely at the interfaces of where things connect. That, that means two people connect with communication. So there are failures in communication from one team to another. Two um, software packages need to integrate. If there are two teams working on specific code, often the failures are where those things connect. If there are two people working on areas of code, Often they do a great job at their part, but integrating them is is key. So, so 
lists have risks because they don't clearly share the integration. Process maps, architecture drawings, and, and other tools that show the integration is important. Um, so that's why this says structure the backlog aligned with the design so we see the integration. Um, and then define the scope of sprints. Each sprint should add to another increment of value should, should be at the end of each sprint. So now let's look quickly at a very, very simple product backlog in Excel. So I didn't make this too complicated because we don't want to get buried in the details and, and lose, lose the, uh, the thought here. This is scalable to very large backlogs. So this is the product backlog with user stories. And the, the first step is to create these user stories so that we understand which user stories fit with each piece of the architecture, the business processes and user experience, people, process and technology. And if we're delivering value, we should understand how is that value going to be used by the user and provide value for the user and for the business process? And what does it look like in the architecture? Um, and, and so if, if a business process, for example, has, I'm going to highlight some, some user stories. If we need this user story and this user story, and this user story to complete a business process, then we don't get value of that business process till we get sprint four done. What we want to do is group those things together, not in the ease of developers doing work, but in the structure of providing end value to the users and the business. Okay. So, so, so that's, that's the product owner's job in prioritizing them. So first we define the, the user stories or the product backlog items and then prioritize them again, aligned with the higher level structures. That's hard work. Um, so that's step six is getting the product backlog organized and then seven is prioritizing them. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the development team that has input that's very important in the prioritization. So the development team may say, it would be much more effective, Mr. Product Owner, uh, if you would move this item 11 up into sprint one, because while I'm doing item number one, item number 11 is very similar, and I'd like to do those at the same time. A similar argument could be made building a house or let's picture a strip plaza, a strip mall on the side of the road that has 10 units that we're going to rent for small shops. The bricklayer, the masons would say, it's easier for me to do the bricks of all of these 10 shops. And then after I get all the brickwork done, then you can move in and do the drywall and do the plumbing and the electrical work and then open up all 10 shops at once. Agile methodologies don't work that way. The bricklayer is, is primarily a team member who can pound nails, maybe do basic plumbing, some basic electrician under the guidance of somebody that maybe has more specialty, and the whole team works together and gets the first store totally done end to end and releases that for value so, so a shop can move in and then the team, and that, that value is fully released, that increment of value is fully released. And then the team can move to um, the second sprint, which could be the second store. Okay, so two different approaches. One is by specialty and in, in how the team thinks they can most effectively work. The other approach is how do we structure things so we're providing increments of value early and often. One approach would, would lead us to doing all the brickwork of all 10 store fronts first. The other approach would be to fully complete 
one store before we do any of the others. And, and that's the more agile approach. So those are thoughts and, and back and forth discussions that the team should have. The developers should be able to make suggestions to the product owner of the sequence, but it's the product owner's call on how to design that and the priorities. So that's step seven is to list the items in prioritized order to deliver value at the end of every sprint. Then estimating, step eight. Um, <clears throat> estimating is where we, we would estimate, I would suggest use planning poker and story points, not time. Um, we could spend, a, you know, we don't have enough time to go through all of planning poker, but, but I would suggest that using planning poker and when you do that, uh, a key part of effective planning poker is to pick a consistent story. Uh, each of these are store, user stories. Pick a consistent user story and use that throughout the whole effort. Um, say a pro if a project's a year long, pick one, one baseline reference story that we're going to use when we estimate. So let, let me talk through what that means. If we pick a login screen, we say, okay, login screen is our reference story and it's five points. Then for the next two years on every single item that we estimate, we're gonna remind the team that a login is five points and we're gonna ask, is this story the same, in which case it gets five points? Is this story a little bit more complex, in which case it maybe get, it gets eight or 13 or 20 or 40 points? Or is this story less complex, in which case it may get three or two or one points? And then if we use that same user story over and over again, then our variation will be much less and back to planning with Scrum, when we roll this up into dates, we'll be much better able to hit our dates um, if, if we have less variation in our estimates. So in summary, I'd suggest using planning poker as defined and use a reference story, define it at the beginning of the project and use it throughout. Um, if team members come and go, then you'll have to adjust from there. Um, so that's estimates. Then accumulate the estimates. Once we, in some of the software packages that are sophisticated, don't do a good job at this, which is why for this um, discussion with you today, I put this in Excel. So here we just, we just accumulate the estimates. Um, one, the first user story has one, the second one has two. So one and two is three, so we put a three here. We add another 13, we get 16. We add five, we get 21. And we keep accumulating those until we get to our assumed velocity. So up here, based on past performance, um, judgment calls, in the beginning, after before sprint one, we're gonna assume we'll, we'll have a velocity of 33, for example. After we get two or three or four sprints behind us, we may change this um, to the average of our past, say, four or past six sprints. But in the beginning, we don't have that experience often. So we, we assume something and refine it. So let's say our, our velocity is 33. We accumulate points till we get about 33, maybe a little under. And then we draw this red line and we say, that's enough for sprint one. And so then we put sprint one here. And then, then we can say, if we're gonna start on January 1st, 2021, two weeks later, we're gonna be January 15th. So now we're starting to see what, as project managers, uh, we're used to are some dates here. Uh, I'd be very cautious in communicating these dates too early until we have some experience behind us, but at least we have a rough draft for our own use. Then we jump down to the next item in the product backlog, 
it's 20 and we accumulate the points to 20 and then we add another 8, 28, add another 5. So now we're at 33. That's about our velocity for that sprint. So we call it sprint 2 and that should be done a couple weeks later. Then we do the same thing for sprint 3 and 4. And then the simple example where we, we have 16 items, this shows we're going to potentially be done after sprint four, which would be, if they're two week sprints, that would be February 26th. What I wouldn't do is go tell the business owner, we're gonna be done February 26th. Um, I would add, you know, based on my experience, that a couple week or, you know, about 25% of work, and then if we have defined work for deployment, user acceptance testing, um, other maybe uh, parallel testing and other work, define that before, you know, in our project schedule, uh, before we commit to any completion dates. So the project schedule wraps around this with all the other items, training and onboarding of people and things like that. Um, so, so in Scrum or Agile methodology, sometimes we have things called a hardening sprint or others um, that we put in here as well. And that's kind of essentially a buffer. Um, so jumping back to the PowerPoint, we covered some of these items. We covered estimating with um, planning poker. We covered assigning things to sprints by looking at um, you have the cumulative estimates in sprint one, two, three, and four. We, we covered the sprint end dates by just adding two weeks to the, the end of every sprint. And we covered the buffer. Sometimes, it's, sometimes if you tell management you have a buffer, they'll say, okay, get done two weeks earlier uh, by removing the buffer. So if we use words like stabilization sprint, or hardening sprint or assign specific work to that, then it doesn't look like we're padding the estimates. Um, you know, obviously, estimates always have a range. Uh, I am very cautious always of, of saying we're gonna be done on a date. We should be communicating a range. Uh, if we need a date, then maybe the date at the end of that range and maybe we come in early. Uh, if For any of you who have been to PMI's global con conferences every year that we have. Um, every year they present the Project of the Year Award. They always come in under budget and under schedule, which tells me they did a good job of understanding and not over committing. They understand the estimates and, and they come in within those estimates. So we don't wanna over commit. We need to, we need to understand that estimates have a range and add the appropriate, whatever we call it, I call it a buffer to that, okay? So we covered those. Then we go to the sprint backlog. We pull the defined items from the product backlog here into the sprint backlog. And this is where it comes back to systems engineering and systems design. We should understand that if we do these items, they are not independent line items on a product backlog. These items together create, say, a sub subsystem that has some value that can be delivered to the customer. And designing things in that way is takes effort. It's it's hard. So we would, if we've done that, we'd pull these items from here, put them into a sprint backlog, and we'd start to manage them. The sprint backlog um, is just a shorter version of the product backlog with some additional information. Then we go into sprint planning, <laughs> typical sprint planning for those of you who have um, used Scrum. We get to the next level of detail. In the beginning, we define the hierarchy of could be called theme, epic, story, tasks. In the sprint planning, we get to that lower level of detail, that task level. Reestimate. Um, once we look at things in more detail, that may further inform the plan. And then we go into 
once we have the sprint backlog refined, we do the daily scrum. Uh, three questions. What did I accomplish since we met yesterday? What will I accomplish before tomorrow? What roadblocks do I have? Uh, I've seen experienced teams start to fade away from those three questions because they think they're trivial. Um, these have a lot of um, value in team members committing to other team members. What am I going to accomplish tomorrow? And then tomorrow that team member has to stand up and say, did I do what I said I was going to do yesterday? These are very powerful questions um, in staying on track and hitting the project goal. So when we're talking about planning with Scrum, the, these are very valuable in, in being able to hit the plan. Jesse Fuel, who some of you may know, he helped start what, what kicked off a lot of the Agile um, movement within PMI with the Agile Community of Practice and the ACP. He, Jesse and Mike Griffith um, work together and continue to work together with a lot of things. So Jesse has this fourth question he talks about, will we hit our sprint goals? I think that's very a very good thing to think about and go back to the, uh, the product owner. If we think things are gonna be off track and redesign what will be accomplished within the sprint, so it still provides value. Then the sprint burn down, I'm gonna to go to Excel in a minute, but the sprint burn down is here. We do the sprint review where we actually demo what the user would see. It's not a code review, but we demo what the user would see. Um, and in the sprint retrospective, which is a lessons learned, and then the product backlog. So now, oops. So now let me jump back to Excel and look at backlogs. This is an example of the sprint backlog burndown chart where, um, let me go here, the estimate every day, we'll walk through how this works. Every day we're re-estimating how much work is to be done. And say after the first day of work and we get to the second morning, we say there are 31 points left. If we look at that trajectory and, and extrapolate that out, it doesn't look good. The, the blue line is the burn down, or is the, what I call the glide slope um, of the burn. If, if we have zero work at the end of 10 day of a two week sprint, then we're on track. That's what we want. We want zero work at the end of the sprint. We've accomplished everything that we, we have. So under this line is good, over this line is bad. Here we're over the line and the trend isn't looking good. Um, so now let's add another day. The trend's looking really bad now. Let's add another day. It's starting to look better. Add another day. Maybe, maybe the team did a lot of fundamental work here but didn't finish anything. Now it's looking good. We're, we're under the glide slope. And, and we, can, um, we can start to, to use this information sprint by sprint to help inform our plan. So after about halfway through sprint one, we should have a decent estimate, are we gonna be done with sprint one or not? And this is, this is something that's very powerful for project managers and scrum projects if we don't communicate too early. Um, after halfway through sprint one, we should know, are we on track for sprint one? Back here, we've estimated sprint one, two, three, and four at this with a similar method. If we're halfway through sprint one and we're on track, I would have a little bit more confidence that we're going to be on track for the rest of these. If we're halfway through sprint one and we only have a quarter of the work done, then we're only moving half as fast as we plan to move. I would be real concerned about sprint two, three, four, and five, 
and our overall project schedule based on those early actual results of the burn down chart. So my suggestion is really use these burn down charts. I wouldn't run to the stakeholders and say the project's going to take twice as long after five days of work, but I would be thinking myself ahead of how am I going to manage this if the trends continue. So, so we have the sprint burn down charts, then the product backlog burn down chart. After every sprint, um, so points completed, point, let me go back to here. And this is the actual points remaining. So I'm just going to kind of build this up. So if this is after sprint one, we're at a higher level now. Let me, let me back up and kind of reiterate. The sprint burn down charts updated every day within a two week sprint, for example. The product backlog burn down chart is updated after every sprint with another point. So after we complete sprint one, we update it here. So then after sprint two, maybe we're on track um, a little better. After sprint three, maybe we're a little ahead of schedule. After sprint four, we're still ahead of schedule because this is saying we're gonna have zero work done early. Um, and then after zero work remaining early. And then, um, Right, let me pull this down a little bit so I can get to my button. Okay, and so so the product backlog burn down is very important um, as a tool to align with the overall project schedule. And and we can see very early the the product backlog is a result of the sprint backlog, and the sprint backlog is a result of the daily work. And so we, in Scrum, better than any other method that, that is consistently defined that, that I've seen, Scrum can give us very early indications of actual values of how we're progressing. It can be very powerful for, for using it effectively. Okay. So, so the product backlog works in conjunction with the sprint backlog and ties to the overall project schedule. Then at the end, this, the last step is at the end of a sprint, we deliver, we deliver an increment of value that should be a value to the product owner and the end customer. Um, and, and that only works if we've designed the product backlog in a way that each of these will deliver value. So, um, jump back to PowerPoint. So overall, here are 20 steps at a very high level that can position an Agile project and a Scrum project for success when we have a project by definition that has a start date and an end date and, and we need to deliver value for that project at the end date. So hopefully this is helpful for you. Uh, for some of you, part of this I'm sure is, is a review. This is assembled in a way that has worked successfully on a lot of efforts that, that I've seen. Um, I didn't make up all these processes, many of these are standard, but what, what doesn't happen when a lot of people come to me and ask questions from a variety of companies is these steps don't happen in the way they're put together here to deliver value early and often. And so I, I hope this helps your careers and, and your projects. What comments or questions do you have? Um, we have not had any questions come in, but we do only have five minutes. So I think we can start wrapping it up because I'm sure people have, um, hard stops and you know we appreciate people taking out the time to join us so um if there's anything if there's nothing else from you i think we can start wrapping everything up fred great thanks 
Yeah, so uh, I just want to thank Fred again for the great overview of uh, planning with Scrum. I hope that everyone else also found that as insightful as, uh, as me, and I'm sure there's a lot that everyone can take away and apply to their daily work life. Um, again, you know, we really appreciate the time and effort put, put forward. Um, and again, thanks, Fred, for taking out the time to, to come and share that with us. Um, so as a, as a closing note, I will go ahead and I will bring up my screen and I will share uh, the PDU codes so that you can go ahead and claim those um, on the PMI website for, for your uh, one hour of technical PDU. Um, I also want to remind everybody to use the link in the event website and also in the chat to donate to the local communities. All donations will be going to the Greater Cleveland COVID-19 Rapid Response Fund. So please go to the event site and donate if you can. Um, also, please remember to join us tomorrow for our next topic. Um, okay, so I think people might be having issues seeing my screen. So let me make sure that that is up. Um, and you guys should see those now. Sorry for the delay on that. But um, but please remember to join us tomorrow. Uh, our next topic is leading in turbulent times. Uh, you can register for that at the PMI Northeast Ohio's website if you have not already. Uh, again, I want to thank Fred and all the people who joined us today. And I want to give a special thanks to all the people who are donating. Um, all, din all donations are going to a worthwhile cause and any amount helps. Uh, with that being said, um, that is all we had for today and hope to see you all tomorrow. Stay safe and have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you, everybody.